So these are samples of tap water from Maywood, California. When residents asked for cleaner drinking water, they were told that this satisfies the Safe Drinking Water Act. Our laws like this can only protect you against compounds that we already know are in the water, but new chemicals end up in the water all the time. Recently, 7,500 gallons of methyl cyclohexane methanol, MCHM, were spilled in the Elk River in West Virginia. This is a major local source of drinking water. This chemical had not been in water before. We had no legislation for it, no safety recommendations. The, this chemical had been adopted recently by the coal refining and fracking industries because it was, quote unquote, less toxic than what they'd been using before. However, all they knew about the toxicology of what they'd been using before, uh, or, however, they knew very little about the toxicology of what they were using before and less about MCHM. All we know, there's been one study in rats and a lethal dose has been determined. We know that if a rat eats food made of 825 parts per million of MCHM, it will die. We know nothing else. So this is the only knowledge with which regulators are equipped when they sat down to figure out whether or not this water was safe. So the reasoning went like this, and this is true. Humans are more sensitive to exposure than rats, so we better apply a tenfold correction. So humans are going to be tenfold, maybe, more sensitive to MCHM than the rats were. So maybe it takes only 82.5 parts per million to kill a person. And hey, we vary in our individual susceptibility. It may be an infant is more susceptible than a grown-up. So we better add another tenfold correction to get down to the minimum lethal dose, 8.25 parts per million. And of course, they may have health effects short of outright killing you, so you've got to compute a minimum safe dose. So the minimum safe dose, they added one more correction factor, which magically was picked to be 8.25, giving you a nice round number, a safe dose of one part per million. So, and it just so happens, a nice coincidence, there was just a little bit less in the river than that at the time. So congrats, it's safe to go back to drinking the water. So this sort of thing happens more than you might think. We all remember asbestos used in insulation, used in water filtration, used in cigarettes. When you zoom way in and look close at asbestos, it's this spiny, uh, very nasty looking compound. When fibers of it get lodged in the lung, it creates lesions. Those lesions can become cancerous. Uh, Desplex DES, it was prescribed uh, pr to, to mothers to prevent miscarriage for 31 years in this country. Didn't do anything to prevent miscarriage, but it did cause cancer, birth defects, transgenerational effects. If your grandmother took this, you could be at risk, and we're still figuring that out. So this had untold societal costs that we're still feeling. Atrazine, an herbicide, this is an endocrine disruptor in fish, amphibians, uh, as, as well as uh, invertebrates. Insects, this is illegal in most of the free world. Uh, there's a little three-legged frog, courtesy of atrazine. Uh, so what have we learned from all this? Innovation proceeds. We now have wonderful new nano compounds like carbon nanotubes that are truly revolutionary. They're creating revolutionary new batteries, intrinsically sterile surfaces for medical applications, uh, solar panels, et cetera. But we know very little about their safety. We do know that if you inhale it or if you eat it, it ends up lodged in your lungs and it creates these little lesions. We don't know if those become cancerous in people yet or not. There's no regulation for carbon nanotubes yet. Try close on any bacterials in your toothpaste that's in your hand soap. You probably got lots of it in your house. You've also got lots of it in your drinking water. Try close and breaks down very rapidly in sunlight, but there's no sunlight underground, so it builds up. It bioaccumulates in groundwater. Study in Colorado found if you look at the groundwater, there's not just triclosan in there. There's lots of compounds, including atrazine. Unfortunately, while it's illegal in Europe and Australia, it's still very much legal in the US. And the Midwest uses quite a bit of it. There's some pretty exceptional quantities in uh, some of the drinking water. And of course, when you were exposed to atrazine in the drinking water, that's not all you're getting. You're getting the triclosan too and the other compounds there. So why are we so far behind? We're so far behind because this is the regulatory paradigm. We have toxicological testing, principally in rodent models, and the first thing we do is comp compute the lethal dose. And after we know the lethal dose, then we do testing near that dose and check, oh, does it get cancer? Are there birth defects of the first generation after exposure and things like this? But this takes five years and costs $1.5 million, and we can only do compounds one at a time. So if they have interactions, so if triclosan sensitizes you to disease caused by atrazine, we'll never know in this way. And in all, in all the years we've been doing toxicological testing in the US, we profiled about 7% of the 60,000 compounds that industry releases into the environment. Carbon nanotubes, completely unregulated. You can go online with your Visa card, your PayPal account, buy them for about $250 per kilo. Are they the next asbestos? Are they completely harmless? We don't know. So this paradigm is fundamentally broken. We have to do better. We have to move faster. The answer is responsible innovation. We have to bring analysis by academia and regulation by government agencies onto timescales that are relevant to industry. 
So that's the goal. How do you do that? How do you move so quickly that while a product is being developed, not after it's released, you know what it's going to do to human health and to the environment? It's a grand challenge. It's going to be very hard. We have to be able to make millions of measurements of com many compounds and their mixtures at environmentally relevant dosage, dosages. Uh, we have to be able to understand the effects, not just in humans, but in many species. So we have to be able to extrapolate results from testing in a potentially small subset of species to many others. Uh, that requires collecting data across many species, many genetic backgrounds, uh, and al also at many developmental stage stages. Adolescent or childhood exposure or prenatal exposure or perinatal exposure are not the same as adult exposure. We have to go beyond rodents. This paradigm of rodent principle testing is not sufficient. So this is hard. It means we have to start looking at many individual people. And rats are great. Mice are great. They tell us about mammalian health effects, but they have slow generation times and long gestation. We can look at fish, which have 72-hour uh, embryogenesis, and zebrafish, nice, quick uh, times to observe potential birth defects. We can look at invertebrates, like fruit flies and worms, that have 10-day generation times, so we can very rapidly profile multi-generational effects. But it's not enough even to know the effects on animals. You have to look at the microbiome. You have more bacterial cells in your body than you have human cells. One to six pounds of your body mass is bacteria, not people. And those cells, those bacteria, provide you a lot of services. They do a lot of important things for you. Uh, and all of it plays into your susceptibility or robustness to environmental exposures. In mice, uh, gut bacteria mediate, for instance, obesity. Whether you're a skinny mouse or a fat mouse can be determined by the bacteria you have living in your gut. Uh, bacteria in humans is associated with autism. We don't know if it's causal yet, but we know that kids with autism have very different gut microbiomes than kids without. So it becomes a question. Are we one day going to be able to treat human obesity with yogurt? Are we going to be able to treat behavioral conditions with a smoothie? Mental illness with kombucha? These are all questions we're going to have to answer if we're going to be able to understand and predict the effects of environmental toxicants. At LVNL, we have the MOD SET program, Model Systems for Environmental Toxicology. The goal of this program is to learn the origins of individual susceptibility to environmental exposures. Our approach is to develop a set of model systems where we can do high throughput profiling to understand adverse health outcomes of environmental exposures. The technology that has enabled this, the radical new technologies, now we can now make millions of measurements <laughs> with sequencing. You remember the human genome sequence? Took 10 years, cost $1 billion. Right now you can pre-order your genome for $999. We can also use it to measure the expression of every gene in your body. We can do that. This is a fruit fly responding to cadmium. That is a molecular basis of cadmium toxicity in the fruit fly. That costs $30 now. It'll cost $5 by the end of the year. We can assess the effects of all 60,000 industrial compounds for less than two traditional toxicological studies. This is a paradigm shift. 